Hello and welcome to this Zoom webinar, Will Democracies in the United States and Europe Survive? It is sponsored by the main chapter of the Fulbright Association with funding from the State Department Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs. My name is Rob Lively and I serve as the president of the main chapter. A bit of housekeeping, uh, please sign in to the chat function with your name and your location where you are. I expect many of us have had the experience of when an older family member uh, or parents uh, either needed to downsize or, or they passed away, the question arises, well, what do we do with their things? We had that situation when my father-in-law passed away some years ago. And there we sat in the living room uh, discussing his various things that he had treasured. When the question of who would like Frank's stamp collection arose, there was silence. Nobody said a word. Uh, the stamp collection, nothing. Well, as you know, Americans don't like silence like that. And so I kind of said, well, you know, in high school for a couple of years, I, I collected stamps. Well, that's, that's all it took. They just big smiles on their faces and they handed me Frank's stamp collection. I thanked them profusely, then took them home and completely forgot about them. So here I am now though in my life, I need to downsize. And so recently I was going through Frank's stamp collection and I was very surprised and very pleased to discover this envelope. Now this envelope dates from 1996 and it, uh, it's postmarked from Fayetteville, Arkansas, and it's what's referred to as a first day cover. It's, it's the, it is released the day that the stamps were released. And I was very surprised to see on the envelope was Senator J. William Fulbright. Can you see that? Looks great. <laughs> okay. And it, underneath it says Fulbright Scholarship, the Educational Exchange Program, America's Conversation with the World. The Fulbright Program began right after World War II. And what today, we, it is an example of what today we would call a soft power. And a, a, because it's based on interpersonal relationships, meeting people where they are getting to know them and them, um, them getting to know us. The, the Fulbright program is based on exchanges around educational and cultural events. And folks, we go to other countries and folks from other countries come here. The main chapter of the Fulbright Association continues in that tradition of offering uh, programs and events around educational and cultural events and topics. I think, and that's what today's uh, presentation is about. I think that Senator Fulbright probably would be kind of disappointed in the topic that we have to address today, but that he would be appreciative of the fact that the main chapter is carrying on the Fulbright tradition of conversations around important international topics. So again, please sign into the chat uh, with your name and your location. Thank you for coming. You'll see me again at the end where I'll tell you more about e other events that we're sponsoring. But right now, I'm very pleased to hand over the event to our excellent moderator, Professor Anna Welch. All right, thanks so much, Rob. Welcome everyone. We are so pleased to have you join us in what promises to be an enlightening program with our three panelists exploring their thoughts on whether democracies in the United States and Europe will survive. So as, as Rob mentioned, we ask that audience members please sign into the chat function so that we have an accurate record of attendees. Please include your name and also add whether you are a Fulbright alumna, a member of Friends of Fulbright or a general audience member. All right, before we get started, I wanted to give you an overview of our hour together. Um, with respect to the format, each presenter will have five minutes to speak on the topic. 
followed by questions from you, the audience. Um, and we ask that you place your questions in the, you'll see in your lower navigation bar, the question and answer function on your screen. So please place your questions um, and you can put those in at any point during today's program directly into that Q&A uh, function. And again, the program is about one hour in length. And so with that, I'm really pleased to introduce you to our panelists, uh, Jennifer Yoder, Jason Bobian, and uh, Seth Singleton. I'm not going to take the time out of our busy program to, to provide you with their lengthier bios, uh, where those were included uh, in the announcement and I believe also in the chat. Um, so we're going to proceed right to the individual panelists' presentations before turning to the question and answer portion of our program. And I think we'll begin with you, Jennifer. Thank you. Great, thank you and good afternoon, everybody. Yes, I'm going to start with Europe. Um, it's the region of the world that I teach and research on, um, in particularly Germany, where I was a Fulbrighter in 1989. I was West Germany at the time. Um, in Europe, each country has at least one populist party. Um, and populist is, of course, a very uh, broad term. I am most interested in right-wing populist or extremist parties. And unfortunately, many European countries also have those parties. Um, so challengers to democracy in Europe are frustrating for a number of reasons. I think they're frustrating because they use the language and symbols of democracy to oppose liberal democratic values. They claim to value freedom, to represent the silent majority, to express the will of the people, but they have a very utilitarian approach to democracy. It's great when it helps them be elected to parliament, gets them a seat in a parliamentary committee, allows them to be around the table when decisions are made, but they have very low regard for core democratic values and institutions. When it comes to individual liberty or guaranteeing human rights of all people, they have a very tepid sort of view of, of, of democracy. Uh, they don't respect the rule of law or checks on power or media or judicial independence. Furthermore, they cast themselves as defenders of tradition and the protectors of the national community and culture. Now that might sound okay, um, but protectors from what? From so-called dangerous people, um, and they have in mind migrants and queer folk, dangerous ideas, including histories that they claim make people feel bad or ashamed. The MO of these challenger parties and also social movements that flank them is to stoke fears, to use myths and conspiracy theories to mobilize people and to mobilize them behind a very simple narrative about the past, one that focuses on heroism or the nation's victimhood, but ignores legacies of colonialism, slavery, or culpability for crimes against humanity. These parties and movements seem to, they tend to see things in binary terms. You're either an insider or an outsider, good, evil, friend or foe. They seek a return to simpler times, to homogeneous cultures, they prefer strong leadership and they prefer weak civil societies. They do not want the bonds of trust in society to be strengthened or for people to feel mutual interest. They would prefer people to feel isolated atomized so that they're more easily manipulated. So the question of course, is what can be done to counter these challengers to democracy without succumbing to undemocratic practices? On the one hand, I suppose it might seem easiest to marginalize such parties and movements. Um, you can imagine a ban of extremist parties. And in fact, Germany, um, since you know the beginning of its, its democracy in 1949, has had a constitutional ban on extremist parties. And the Alternative for Germany party in Germany is now under surveillance by the National Office for the Protection of the Constitution. Its youth wing was found to be extremist and is, is in the process of being disbanded. Um, other institutional fixes could be tinkering with electoral rules to make it harder for small challenger parties to emerge or to enter parliament. But these parties exist. They're already in parliaments. The cat is out of the bag. Um, so what else can, can be done? Um, competition, competing more effectively against these parties is I think the better solution. 
for mainstream parties on the center left and center right in Europe. Um, and those parties have lost a great share of their voters in, in the past few election cycles. And so I think they need to make themselves relevant again. I think they need to campaign more effectively. I think they need to um, beat these challenger parties at their own social media game. And they need to more effectively mobilize young and new voters, um, maybe find non-voters. This is something that in the United Kingdom the Leave campaign, the pro-Brexit campaign did very cleverly uh, using data analytics. They found 3 million or so unmobilized voters, which tipped the scale toward Brexit. Um, they need, I think the, the mainstream parties need to reinvigorate some of their auxiliary organizations, such as their youth wings, um, voter education, media literacy are other things that can be done. And finally, at the EU level, um, the EU has some tools to counter democratic backsliding. They could suspend the voting rights of EU members um, in the EU Council. They can fine member states who are backsliding on democracy. And most importantly, they can now withhold EU funds. And I think that might make the difference in Hungary and Poland. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks so much, Jennifer. All right, we're going to turn it next over to um, to Jason. Oh, and you're mute. You're still muted. Oh, there we go. Okay, <laughs> working the mute button there. Um, no, it's great to be here. Um, you know, I, I'm a reporter, been covering pretty much international affairs for all of my career, uh, at least the last couple of decades of it. Uh, and while well, Jennifer was just talking about some of the like mechanics of what's what's happening in Europe. Um, I'm seeing some trends that are happening globally that also are out are playing out in Europe and in, in the United States. And it, it almost is like somewhat obvious, but the threat of war continues to be a huge threat to democracy, because obviously, when you have a, a country neighbor invading a country, um, potentially taking it over, the the last uh, vote that someone cast in that country no longer matters, right? It's out the window because you have governments changing for, for these types of reasons. And, and that's what happened in Crimea when Russia seized it from Ukraine in, in, in 2014. Uh, you know, Russia's attempt to, to take over all of Ukraine has been far more complicated. But I think at times here in the United States, given that we're not in an active war, many parts of the country, many parts of the world, sorry, look fairly stable. We often don't think about the threat that armed conflict and war uh, poses to democracies, to the ability for uh, the democratic process to function. And it's not even just the actual act of an invasion occurring. You know, I think that what has happened in, in, in Europe uh, with, with Russia's invasion of Ukraine has had ripple effects through Moldova, through Georgia. I mean, obviously we've got Sweden and Finland uh, moving into NATO. Um, and you, and another thing, you just look, look at Sudan, right? Well, up until recently, Sudan seemed to be going, um, moving in Africa into a place of being a better country than it had been before, getting along better with its neighbors. And then last month, boom, everything blew up. Um, and so that threat of armed conflict uh, sort of lingers out there. Uh, and there are a lot of other places in the world where things are still tense, you know? There's the, the Koreas, there's a potential for something happening in Taiwan, um, a, a conflict between India and Pakistan and Kashmir these are these could really happen you know like it's it's not completely theoretical uh and and i think thinking about that is important when we think about democracies and the threats to democracies um another big issue is climate change um this is something that is happening when countries are in crisis democracy democratic processes can't occur. You can't be holding elections when all of the polling stations are flooded. You, 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 know, you can't be trying to change governments at a time when the nation is, is falling apart and dealing with massive flooding. Uh, and, and thirdly, I would say that information and misinformation uh, is another 
thing that is happening now in this time that is also unlike uh, what was happening even 10 years ago. When I, I mentioned that in, in the context of what I just was saying about climate change, we're dealing with some different threats, new threats, new um, challenges to, to democracies. I, and you know, never before has there been so many potential media um, outlets and content available so freely it, to, to, to people. And you know, it used to be that if the president said something and it was quoted in the paper, the president most likely said that. I, now you look online and you can find videos of President Biden saying just about anything that are just completely fake. And AI bots can make a Drake song that sounds exactly like a Drake song. Um, so this question about what is true um, is a huge challenge to democracies because we, we believe that people are gonna make the right decision because there are certain things that are true. But if that has gotten thrown out the window, you know, what is a fact, what is not a fact? Uh, and that really has been happening and it's not just happening in the United States, it's happening in Europe, it's happening in the Middle East, um, it's happening in Brazil. Uh, this is another huge challenge that just wasn't really on the table 20 years ago. And, and I think that there are some very new um, challenges, war being an old challenge, but uh, so, some new challenges that, that make this landscape different than it, than it was even just a few years ago. Fantastic, thanks, Jason. All right, we'll turn it now over to Seth. Yeah, thank you, uh, Robin Celeste and Anna and Jen and Jason for the opportunity to be here. Um, I'll try to say something about three things. What do we mean by democracy? How democracy in the United States is on very shaky ground? And third, why the Western alliance of democracies may wither. First, democracy requires, I think, three things. Liberties or rights protected for all citizens, regardless of the wishes of the government in power. Now, there are always arguments about what those liberties should be. But for democracy to exist, they must include free access to information, and freedom to speak and share opinions. Second, the regular ability to change the government peacefully. In the American phrase, you can throw the bums out. Third, equal inclusion of all citizens in the political process. Democracy does not require particular policies regarding, for example, immigration or social security or economic distribution or abortion. Now, the United States. In the Economist Democracy Index for 2022, the United States is a flawed democracy ranking number 30, just below Israel and just above Slovenia. The US slipped four places in the previous year. Legitimacy of government has been declining in this country for over 20 years. 70% of citizens think the country is on the wrong track. Most people correctly think Polarization has made government ineffective and dysfunctional, and they blame the other side for causing and abetting it. Congress has an approval rating of 20%. Half the country, one half or the other half, thinks the president is illegitimately in office. The Supreme Court has had declining approval since the 1990s, and fewer than half of all citizens now think it deserves respect. These trends seem to be accelerating. Consider the budget and deficit, limit negotiations, uh, money given secretly to Supreme Court justices, and the, in the inability of both political parties to advance new candidates for president. Americans now realize that the Constitution itself hinders democracy. Just imagine a constitutional amendment that said each US citizen must have equal weight in choosing the president. The entire political landscape would be transformed. Candidates would have to pay attention to Democrats in Mississippi and Republicans in California, and not just six counties in Wisconsin and the city of Phoenix, Arizona. The Electoral College was tolerable as long as it reflected the overall popular vote, but that is no longer true. And if five of six conservative justices on the Supreme Court accept the independent state legislature theory, which holds that only the legislature in each state determines electoral results, 
the Republicans have already won the 2024 election. Minority presidents, unrepresentative Senate, gerrymanders locking in one party rule, black money enabled by the court, the drawing of congressional districts to disenfranchise minority voters, no serious democracy would allow any of this. Legitimacy plots. A 2020 analysis showed the US Republicans on the same, in the same political zone as European far right parties. They were getting up right up there with the German AFD and they were right in there with Viktor Orban's Hungary and Erdogan's Turkey. Let's assume that Republicans actually win. Schedule F proposed by Trump, but not implemented, will replace top civil servants with political appointees, including in what Russians call the power ministries, Justice Department, FBI, military. Judicial appointments will again be vetted by the Federalist Society. Now, all of this may be a good thing. That depends on your political point of view. My point is that it isn't democracy. I give Trump about a 60 to 70% chance of winning the election. Turnout is likely to be low. Black and Latino men will continue to shift to Trump and younger voters may stay home in the seven or eight contested states, which are the only ones that matter. Biden won in 2020 as the non-Trump. Now he's dragging the baggage of inflation, immigration, crime, and debt ceiling uncertainty. Biden will be 82 and has no charisma. Trump voters will be all out to win their grudge rematch and in their view, save the country. I may be mistaken. Biden could win if the economy is booming and Trump's legal baggage keeps getting heavier. Or we could have a black swan. Biden or Trump knocked out by a heart attack, a wave of support for some dark horse politician, war beyond Ukraine, giving Biden the chance to wave the flag. Uh, Trump's vice presidential choice may matter too. My long shot bet is Tim Scott. Now, Consider the implications for US-European relations. Easiest is Ukraine. If he possibly can, Putin will hang on until November 2024 without concessions. A Trump win will stifle aid to Ukraine and cooperation with Europe. Conversely, the Ukrainians are impelled to try for quick gains and they will also hedge by getting closer to the Europeans. If Biden wins, there's a good chance support will continue, but there's a hitch. In foreign policy, Americans are not polarized. We have a consensus that the United States should not intervene by force or risk US vital interests for larger international goals. This is essentially now an isolationist country. There is no broad constituency in the United States for democracy promotion in Sudan or aid to imperiled humanity in Haiti or confronting dictators in places like Myanmar. Ukraine is an exception because the turf is European, the enemy is evil Putin, the Ukrainians and Zelensky fit the heroic mold and the Russian invasion really is imperialism and aggression. Trump has said informally that he would like to take the US out of NATO. He detests the EU because it is supranational and because it is wimpy. The 2018 photo of Angela Merkel lowering at Trump is worth a thousand words. In a second Biden administration too, ties to Europe may wither. The strategy will be to thwart Putin and then leave Russia to the Europeans as attention turns to China. Europe detached from US influence sounds more like Emmanuel Macron than Biden's rhetoric about the alliance of democracies, but I think that's where we're headed. Perfect, thank you all. So let's turn now to the question and answer period of our program. And just as a reminder to the audience, please be sure to place your questions into that question and answer function on the lower bar there of your screen. Um, 
So maybe I'll I'll pose the first the first question. How do you think the challenges faced by the democracies in the US and Europe compare to those in other regions of the world? Um, are there any lessons uh, that can be learned from the experiences of other countries? And I'll leave that question to any one of you or all three of you. I, I'm, I'm happy to, to jump in on that. I mean, I, I think that uh, the, the democracies in, in Europe and the and United States, Canada, um, the, the rule of law that's established it, it are sort of the envy of the world. In, in many, you know, developing countries, the, the, the one of the big goals is to get to a point where you've got that stability, you've got that basic backbone that you have seen in the past in Europe and in the United States and Canada and Australia and in places that have allowed economies to flourish, allowed the middle class to expand. Um, and so I, I think that the, the big question here is to what degree are those now under threat? And, um, and I think there are definitely some, some issues out there that are making those uh, democratic values that have been sort of the envy of many places in the world um, made uh, people start to question whether that's going to, to continue. Um, so I, I think that ultimately, I, I think that things are, um, I, you know, I'm comparing this to a lot of places that, that I would have covered, you know, including places like Haiti and and places some of the some of the poorest countries in the world. But it's always been this big question of what does it take to make a successful country that um, allows ordinary citizens to flourish? And there are some models out there, and you, the U.S. and Europe have managed to do that in the past. There's a lot of um, there appear to be some cracks in, in that formula now. Um, but but ultimately, I, I think that, that there, those those models are are things that we have seen in the past in in these places. Yeah, go ahead, Seth. Yeah, go ahead, Seth. Yeah, thanks. Um, I tend sometimes to be a contrarian, and let me try it this way. Uh, I think democracy was a favored view around the world, so long as. Europe, but particularly the United States, was seen as an economically successful, prosperous, and well-run country. As that changes, I think the support for democracy will change. It also had something to do with U.S. clout in the world and promoting democracy. U.S. clout is diminishing rapidly. China's too, by the way, but that's another story. And, um, you know, we just don't have the tools to do the democracy promotion anymore. So I think between those two things, where you end up is that unlike 30 years ago, the ability of popular movements to overthrow dictatorships has gone down, down, down. Look at Venezuela, look at Iran, look at Belarus, look at Myanmar. Uh, what Russians call color revolutions just don't work anymore. Hmm. Just a, a quick add on to that. I'm thinking more of, of the European democracies versus the United States. And, and I do think um, that the memories of, of the world wars do still weigh heavily on many Europeans. And you know, I think that the lesson was that nationalism kills and these parties in their, their ultra nationalism at times, um, I think really frighten people. And um, you know, I, I think that the EU does lend another layer of accountability. Um, it doesn't have the possibility of expelling a member. That's not part of its constitutional treaties or its treaties. But um, it does have and is, I think, fleshing out other tools, which I think is starting to use to put pressure. And peer pressure does work on countries. And I think that's one of the problems that the United States has. We see it as a advantage, but we, we don't have any peers that put pressure on us. We don't compare ourselves to other countries. We don't take cues. And, um, and I think that's where hopefully some of the other countries around the world that are experiencing challenges to democracy will be different, that they will understand they won't have markets to sell their products or fewer markets, or they won't have the you know their, their partners that will have their backs because they are 
behaving illiberally. Terrific. Um, and just a reminder to go ahead and put your um, questions into the into the chat function or the Q and A function. There, I'll, I'll just a quick follow up from me, um, maybe to Jason initially, because I think you you raised this in your response to that first question. But really exploring how economic inequalities and social divisions impact the resilience, right, of of democracies, and how that might be evolving in the U.S. and Europe as factors, right, in terms of potentially some failures in, in the democratic. Um, democracies in various countries. And Jason, maybe you first, but others as well can chime in. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think that um, um, economics and sort of the personal economics are huge factors in, in democratic um, institutions and also in the way that people operate in democracies. When people are really struggling economically struggling to feed their their children, feed their families um, to survive. Uh, people are much more willing to, to go with um, a, 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 an autocratic um, a leader. I, I mean, I think Turkey under Erdogan is a perfect example of that. It, he has a lot of support at the moment and his election, I believe it's this weekend. Um, you know, he's been in power for 20 years. He promised a lot. He actually delivered cheap housing. Uh, it provided what many people wanted in Turkey was this opportunity to move into a flat, you know, a, a condo and move away from what was seen as for sort of an agrarian uh, lifestyle. Unfortunately, a lot of those buildings that he delivered in, crumbled in this last earthquake. Um, it, but definitely, I think a lot of his political support came from his appeal to people's pocketbooks and his his selling Turks on the idea that he is going to make your life better. Um, and um, that that plays out well. It allows at, at times autocrats to 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 manage to you know, stay in power. Uh, and I think it's something that you're, you know, it's, he's not the only one in the world um, who's doing that. But I, I do think that economics and um, economic inequality are, are huge factors in, in, in whether democracies function well. Yeah. Thanks. Beth, did you have your hand up? Do you want to? In the 1950s, a brilliant historian at the University of Chicago, David Potter, wrote a little book called People of Plenty. His argument was very simple. He said Americans love democracy because it thinks it, they think it makes them rich. And I think there's a whole lot to that. Uh, if you're working two jobs and can't buy hamburger anymore because the price has just gone up 30 percent, uh, somebody has screwed up. And I don't think that's terribly complicated. And that's essentially what's been going on in this country off and on for the last 20, 30 years. At some point, the myth of you can just make it if you work harder is going to crack. And I think we're getting pretty close to that. That myth is what props up the system. Um, Jennifer, I don't know if you, I can move on. There's some questions in, in the Q&A now. Okay. so. Um, Michael Sokolo uh, raised a question, uh, and I'll, I'll state it here. There seems to be basic, almost foundational issues with assumptions about media rights and their relationship to democratic functionality. For example, the assumption that a, quote, free press, end quote, is essential to, to democracy is being tested here in the U.S. Uh, with the profusion of misinformation. Other democracies, Australia, United Kingdom, don't have a First Amendment and do fund state broadcasting and media licensing. Some democracies have strict media laws, Germany and mention of Hitler, for example, could quote media freedom itself th uh, threaten democracy here in the United States? It's a great question. I'll turn it over to any one of you or all three of you. I'll, I'll yes. let one of you <laughs> jump in on that, yes. I was gonna say, Go. Jason, this is your question. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as a member of the media, I'm not sure I really want to jump in on that. Uh, I can only take it from the opposite end of being in places where, you know, there is no free press, where um, 
you go to a, a press conference and they hand out packets of cash to all of the local journalists. And then, you know, that's the expectation of what's what is supposed to get written that day. Um, you know, this still happens in many places in the world. Um, in, and I'm talking about low, well, you know, and it's interesting. I mean, you know, Mexico isn't necessarily a low-income country, but the press has really been um, controlled by media, by by business interests, by criminal interests, um, uh, and and I think it affects. You know, I, I was based in Mexico City for four years. Uh, this is a country with incredible potential. That I left there feeling like the biggest issue here is. The, the lack of a rule of law and the lack of uh, accountable systems, governmental systems, and a lack of people having faith in that their government works for them. Um, and, and I think that if Mexico could overcome that, it, it would just, it, it already is an amazing country, but it could be so much better and would, would blossom economically, um, I think in so many ways. If, if those problems could be sorted out. Um, and I think that the lack of um, a press that is um, able to do what it wants to do in Mexico is, is, a, is part of the problem. Um, on the US side, I'll let other, others weigh in on that. If I were um, Donald Trump's communications director in a new administration, First thing I would do would be to instruct everybody, including all the new political appointees, that all information about government can be re released exclusively through Fox News. Jason, you'd have to watch Tucker Carlson to find out what was going on. That's just the start. It's not rocket science. I, I know. I know the viewers were hoping for you know some uplifting counter arguments, but um, as a, a professor of undergraduates um, who have remarkably high test scores, uh, yet still confess they don't read any news media except what comes over their social media feed in little tiny condensed, probably absolutely skewed bits. Um, that's, that's sobering. That's really sobering. And, um, you know, just to about sort of balancing freedom of speech with other rights. Um, you know, I think some Europeans have a sensitivity about human dignity and it being harmed by, you know, freedom of speech when it comes to the internet or other forms of media. And, you know, I, I do think with most of our modern technologies and, and quandaries, it requires some balancing. And to err completely on the side of one absolute freedom of speech, no matter what, no matter who gets harmed in the process, um, does seem to be deleterious to the health of democracy. I mean, it's an opinion, yes, but um, I'll put it out there. I'll just also throw out that, I mean, I, I think that the, it's been very interesting with the U.S. Supreme Court um, and some of the revelations that have come out recently. Um, there, there are often institutions out there that don't really have any oversight by anybody, right? And the U.S. Supreme Court being one of them. And it has been the press pounding away, digging up um, information that some of the Supreme Court justices have been getting some things that just really don't seem like it would be in the normal course of business that you'd be getting, you know, vacations paid for uh, at, at such a level, getting your children, getting education at private schools paid for by a, a major donor to one of the political parties. Uh, you, that, and I think that this has been a great example of where the press and having a free press that's able to operate and doesn't have to worry about getting shot for doing it um, matters. And, and, and I think that, that um, this is just one example. And I think in Europe, you also have, have examples of investigative uh, work at Der Spiegel and at many other um, outlets that, that it, re it really matters. And there's not a lot of places in the world where there's the resources and the, the freedom for journalists 
to do that. I, I think that um, it's it, it continues to be um, a, a huge issue in the Middle East. Um, China trying to operate as a journalist in China is a very dangerous operation. And I mean, you look at what's happening in, in Russia. We have a Wall Street Journal reporter, um, you know, facing espionage charges there now. It, there are many places in the world where attempting to shed light on what's happening in the government, what's happening in, in the world uh, can be a very dangerous operation. And so I, I think that um, it's worth underscoring <laughs> how at least we still are able to do that uh, in the U.S. Right. And I think there's certainly pros and cons of having a free press, but what a privilege that we can even have this conversation without fear of, of being killed or somehow um, you know, detained or harmed. So um, trying to, well, we do, I know there's some questions on like, what's some silver linings? What are some answers? And I definitely want to turn to that, but I want to address a couple of the other questions first before we hopefully end on a, on a um, I guess, a more, um, a happier note. So uh, Timothy Burris raised just more of a comment, but related to sort of um, access to the vote. So one of the stories in the last national election that I wish had gained greater traction, indeed had elicited wide shock and consternation, was that, was that there was a single drop box in the county that includes Houston, Texas. The impact on partic participation of lower income voters with greater transportation challenges, et cetera, might be hard to quantify, but it must have been considerable. So sort of access to voting and what role that plays in terms of our democracy. I don't know if anyone wants to speak on, speak to that comment. And even maybe propose what are some solutions, right? Um, or ways to counteract some of the um, voting challenges that we're seeing. Yeah, I'm, I'm no expert on this um, at all. I mean, obviously, the more you can encourage every citizen to have a vote, the more democratic you become. I don't think that, you know, and, and I think it's clear that uh, that in the cases of Texas and a whole lot of other places, there's an attempt to chip away at the margins to discourage people, particularly in cities, uh, from voting. Um, and the question is, how much can you get away with? And that uh, that's a matter for politics and the press and the courts. And I'm, I'm not really an expert on that. But, uh, you know, it's also the case that you can encourage voting in those places where you know you're going to win. And uh, in that sense, just uh, just having more votes doesn't necessarily make you a better country. I don't know what Erdogan is going to do on Sunday, encouraging the vote, but I'm sure he's going to encourage a whole lot of people to vote, and maybe several times for him. Um, so I think I think voting is 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 really complicated. I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, and especially in a very decentralized system such as ours, um, where you have fifty, basically election management schemes, right? Um, and of course, it's it's hard to claw back any of that power that has been decentralized to a central authority. But there are other examples, democratic systems, where there's an electoral management agency, um, you know, that makes sure that every electoral district is of the same size in terms of population. They don't gerrymander. That's one of our own unique, unique in innovations. Um, and you know you you're not likely to have a locality that is an aberration because it has one drop box. Um, you will see more uniformity and hopefully high quality, um, you know, election policies. Perfect. Um, so Elaine Podiker has a question specifically for you, um, Seth, but certainly can broaden broaden it to others as well. So. Um, you present a sobering view of the status of democracy in terms of the way it's supposed to work. Um, what do you feel is the way forward for the Biden administration, given the issue raised and the direness of inequality throughout the world? Where do you even begin? I have a different candidate for president. I think we need somebody who is clearly forward-looking and inspiring. Um, Joe Biden is a fine man and he did his job, um, but what we need now is some version of 
maybe not in character, but in electoral presentation, John Kennedy. Somebody young and somebody people can really latch on to. I think that would move the country forward. Um, <clears throat> the Democrats in the United States, in my view, and I'm, again, I defer to, you know, Jan, uh, Jason on this as much, um, ha have become, in fact, with a small c, the conservative party. They are the ones who don't want to change the system. The radicals are the Republicans. They happen to be right-wing radicals, but they're the radicals. And I think that uh, that we need some, you know, some radical views, not progressive necessarily, but radical proposals, like giving everybody an equal vote for president that would come out of the Democrats and others. Um, I just like to see them do it. Any names uh, was the follow-up question, who you might propose would run instead? I don't know. I keep thinking about that. I think it could be any one of a number of people who could be promoted. Um, I would easily vote for Gretchen Whitmer. I would easily vote for Senator Bennett of Colorado. These are all people I think could actually win a presidential election. And there's plenty of time to, uh, you know, to make them prominent in the media. Uh, but I don't think it's going to happen. <laughs> I, again, I'm not optimistic um, about that. But I, I, I think there's got to be some inspiration that's different from the inspiration of the MAGA crowd who are inspiring to their followers. And I just don't see it at the moment. I mean, I think in the last election, you did have like Andrew Yang proposing, you know, a basic income sure. and some, so, so, so I think there were some ideas that that came out. I don't, I think I agree with you that there was no candidate that uh, was really able to inspire people. Uh, but I, I definitely agree with you that I think that the idea of someone who is focused more on the 21st century and what the latter half of the 21st century is going to be like rather than the 20th is really going to be key uh, to whether um, <laughs> whether this the United States is able to move forward. I mean, it is one thing about China, right? They come up with their five-year plans. They actually have this strong plan of this is what we need. This is how we're, and this is something that the United States doesn't do well um, and hasn't been doing well lately is looking forward to where should this country be 10 years from now. Um, and it's something that seems to be, um, I, I will say, I think the United States is getting outflanked in, in Africa and a lot of low-income countries uh, around the world by China because they do have that longer-term view. They're like, we need these types of resources. We need so much copper. We need X, Y, and Z. And this is how we're planning to get it. Um, it can be brutal at times, the way they go about doing that. Um, but at times, there doesn't even seem to be a recognition in the United States that other countries are doing that planning for what should what should our economy look like in, in 20, 2050? And not, you know, I'm obviously there's think tanks that are doing that and whatnot, but it doesn't seem to be happening at the political level. Um, and I, I think that is something that, that the United States is, um, uh, you know, could be an Achilles heel. I, I'm not sure about planning. Planning can be useful in some ways. What I'd like to see is just a burst of creativity in all kinds of ways, technological, economic, political, that we need in this country. And creativity tends to be a little unplanned. Um, by the way, I want to uh, tell everybody, I'm actually quite optimistic about the world as a whole. I think the rest of the world is going to do pretty well at uh, confronting some of the things that ail us. And I think eventually the United States will catch up with them. So maybe sort of also hopeful, right? What lessons, if any, and Alan presented this question, what lessons, if any, can we draw from the defeat of Bolsonaro in Brazil and whether that, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Anyone want to speak in more depth to that? I mean, well, I think it's, it's one of those many uh, uh, events that shows that there is a really strong constituency in a lot of places we're not having authoritarians or dictators. And I think that's really clear. I mean, it's clear in Iran, it's clear in Belarus, it's clear in Myanmar, it's clear in Sudan. 
And the question is, how do you break through the, you know, the crust of repression in those places? And Brazil, being an, an actual democracy, managed to do it. I'm, I don't necessarily see that as a contrary or, or uh, you know, opposite event of any sort. I think that could happen in a lot of places if, in fact, you give them, give people the chance. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what's going to happen in Turkey on Sunday. It's going to be really interesting. Right. And then I, I maybe a follow up to that even is Mary and John Benzinger raised the question, do you see any signs of hope that democracies will survive the counterbalance of sort of what we're sharing? For any of you, I don't know, Jennifer, if you want to speak to that or, or others. Oh, I mean, I think you, you have to look at, so what's the alternative, right? I mean, that's, that is, <laughs> that's the question. And so I think that, I think they will survive. I think it's a question of uh, whether they survive well. Um, it, you know, democracy, this process is not a, in a road without, without potholes. Um, so I think that they will, it's just a question of, um, yeah, how many bumps there, there's gonna be along the way. Yeah, I, I agree. And, um, you know, there's been, of course, a flurry of scholarship, a flurry of books about what, what's gone wrong and what, where to go from here. Um, but I, I think one of the things they have in common is just a reminder. It's a pretty simple message that, um, you know, democracy is not an endpoint, but it's a, it's a process. It requires um, nourishing. It requires, um, you know, making adjustments. And there, there's some issues that um, democracies seem fairly ill-equipped to deal with. Um, I mean, you know, climate change, everybody, you know, look around Maine. People are idling their big pickup trucks on a hot day just so they can talk on the phone and air conditioning. Okay, obviously, I have a pet peeve, but um, I mean, it, there, these are huge challenges, which would be more effectively dealt with by a dictatorship. But, but you know, we don't want to go there. So I, I, I think, you know, we just have to remind our, ourselves that um, at the core of a democracy is the demos, the people, and, and the people, you know, need to speak up, um, need to demand better governance. Um, and and I, do, I do see some signs that that can happen, is happening. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of evidence that the sort of world decline of democracy has bottomed out, that there's a whole lot of push in the pro-democracy direction around the world. Um, I just like to see it wash back to this country a little more. Right. And I, I love sort of the point on, on hope. I know uh, we assigned to our students a, a speech by Brian Stevenson, who says that hopelessness, right, and apathy is sort of the death of progress, the so death of justice, and it's so important that we maintain some hope, otherwise there certainly won't be movements in the right, in the right direction. Um, we have just a, a few more minutes. Um, just curious if, if you all have any thoughts on specific policy recommendations or changes uh, to safeguard and strengthen democracies both here in the U.S. and throughout the world. Not it's a small question for a quick wrap up. <laughs> but just any final thoughts with sort of ending on what can we do? Specific policy suggestions. Well, I'm, you know, as a journalist here, I'm going to just make a pitch for, uh, you know, I think having more information, having free access to information, having a free press, I, I think is really important. And I just think that it's, it, it's, you know, it's not something that can, can be, can be overlooked. I, you know, um, governments uh, will do whatever they can to make themselves and look the best they can. And there needs to be an outside force um, that is able to, to play the watchdog role. And in any, any system, you need people to, that are there to, to question, to, to ask whether, is this the right way to go? Was somebody skimming money? Um, 
what potentially could be um, the, the consequences of this that are not coming from that inner circle. And I think the press plays a really important role in that. And so as difficult as it can be at times as, um, and as messy, especially with so many different um, media outlets now coming at things from all different angles, I think it's important that there's a, a freedom to do that. And so I, I think that that, that is really a, um, a, a key to having strong democracies. Yeah, I, I have a, actually a question for Jan. Uh, it seems to me, and I, you know, I defer to you, you know a lot more about this than I do, that democracy in Europe is actually doing very well, that the far right has been marginalized in most places, unlike in the United States. And, uh, you know, Giorgio Maloney gets elected in Italy, uh, but why does she get elected? Well, she says, I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to move Italy out of the EU. I'm not going to leave the Euro. I'm going to support the Ukrainians. And then she gets elected. In effect, you, you can't really, and, and actually, uh, you know, uh, Marine Le Pen in France, uh, same kind of trajectory. You can't do it as a far right candidate. And in fact, uh, democracy thrives. I think the Europeans are going to be the world champions of democracy in the next generation. And I think, uh, you know, while we get our act back together in the U.S., and I think we will, I just don't think it's going to be immediate. Um, and this is going to be fine. Japanese, too. <laughs> you know, they have a kind of a one-party state, but it's a very democratic country. There are plenty of places that are beacons of democracy in the world. We're just used to thinking of ourselves as the only and shiningest one. And, and uh, you can't really cope with the idea that may not be true. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. I do agree. I mean, the, the multi-party systems are pluralism on display, um, competition, you know, sometimes you lose, you have to regroup, figure out what we can do better next time. And if this, you know, the old centrist parties can't figure it out, well, the Greens on the left and the, you know, national conservatives on the right will will step in and do it. But I think you're right that there are are enough guardrails to use a well-worn term um, in in the European context that even if it's Maloney or I noticed in the chat Le Pen, I mean, you know, a few years ago, you know, we all got apoplectic when we thought about a Le Pen presidency, but. It doesn't seem so unlikely anymore, actually. Um, and does that mean France will slip into dictatorship? I, I absolutely don't think so. Um, not if the you know French people have anything to say about it. Um, you know, they will make her life very difficult, I think, if she steps too far out of the mainstream. Um, but I, I will say I do think it's much easier to make a correction hate to say it, in a parliamentary system than it is in our checks and balances, separation of power system. Um, you know, our model of federalism is very hard to change. Our constitution obviously is very hard to change. Composition of the Supreme Court matters so much. Um, and, it, you know, it's not a matter of, of legislating uh, reforms. Um, yeah. So, yeah. The 18th century clockwork has run out of lubricants. I mean, it just, you know, and it's seizing up. I mean, this is, I think, if you step back a little and just look at it, that's just as you're saying. It's perfectly clear that that's going on. And of course, that means you really got to change the system. And that's always hard to do. Right. Well, we are unfortunately almost out of time. Just thank you all so much again uh, for your insights, your expertise, and really a fascinating discussion. I'm going to turn it back over uh, to Rob to for some uh, closing remarks. But um, yeah, thank you all again. And sorry we didn't get to all of the questions, but thanks for these great questions as well. Yes, and I would like to add my thanks for such a wonderful conversation. I think one thing that I've taken away from this is that democracy is a verb. It is something that we can work on, that we need to work on. And especially now, because there are so many important and concerning things happening in the world that uh, really need our attention. And um, I would also like to thank Celeste Branham, our vice president, who initiated, developed, and nurtured this whole topic from the very beginning. And also our secretary, Kirsten Brewer, 
who's providing the behind the scenes uh, electronic wizardry to, to make this event uh, available to you. Very quickly, we have two upcoming events. This afternoon, 4 to 6 p.m. at the Flight Deck Brewing in Brunswick at 11 Atlantic Avenue. We're having free pizza and just continue this conversation and just get to know each other better. And then on June 3rd, we're having a storytelling event. It's going to be at the Fields Pond Audubon Center in Holden up near Bangor. Uh, there's going to be a tour of the facility and of the grounds at 1030, a light lunch at noon, and then storytelling at one o'clock. We encourage you to, to think of a story to tell. The limit, it, it has a five minute limit. It has to be about you and it has to be true. Uh, it can be on any topic. So uh, we hope to see you there. Thank you once again to all involved. Thanks for our participants and for our viewers. And we wish you a goodbye. Goodbye.